today, this morning, God has given me a word. And uh, I know that uh, today a lot of us have woken up this morning, especially children. You went to your moms and you said, Happy Mother's Day. So I just want to take this time to thank all the mothers. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Amen. The role that mothers do is vital and critical. Uh, and uh, some of the children looking at me, oh, today's Mother's Day. You can wish after church, okay? So anyway, what I'm trying to say is like, it's a special uh, day, especially when we take this time to thank God for the strength that he's given to each one of us to raise our children. This is not to say that fathers are not important. Your day is coming, okay? <laughs> In the month of August, I will get to you guys, okay? So uh, let, us, uh, let us read John chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. John chapter 14, verse 5 and 6. Amen. Hallelujah. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When we read the scriptures, the scripture that most of us know, even uh, you know, children recite this verse when they're here, they learn it in Sunday school. But that, that verse there, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we have been looking through the Gospel of John so far, we know that this statement is the sixth I am statement of Jesus. There are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. When we read John chapter 15, we will get into the seventh statement. But this is the sixth statement that Jesus is saying. And he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But let's pay attention to Thomas's question. Why does Thomas ask this question? It's because of verse 3 and 4. We looked at verse 3 last week, so we'll read it again. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Verse 4, you know the way to the place where I am going. So Jesus is saying, I'm going away to the disciples. I'm going away with the purpose to prepare something for you. We looked at that last week. It is a room. It is a many mansions in my father's house. It is not separate mansions as we imagine. It is many mansions or many rooms in my father's house. And so God has promised his children that he's going to come back and take him and, uh, so that they will be also where Jesus is. So verse 4 you know the way to the place where I am going. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to a place, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you know that way. And Thomas, like the faithful Thomas he is, the doubting Thomas that we know, uh, who came to India to preach the gospel, and God uh, you know, strengthened him to do so, he asked the right question. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? What way are you going to take? You're telling us that you, you're going to go to a certain place and prepare a house and mansions for us. Uh, that's great. This is good. But uh, you said we know that way. What way is that? Where is the address of that location? Jesus says, you know that way. Thomas is like, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And then Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying he is the only way to the Father. His life is the way to God. When we look at Jesus' life, we have been studying Jesus' life. Jesus did not have a big house, a big car, a big name, a big, big uh, you know, wealth. But he is saying his life is the way to the Father. His life demonstrates how to go to the Father. And this is why Jesus told that his disciples, you should deny yourself and follow me. Where do we follow Jesus? Why are we following Jesus? Because Jesus is the way. He has shown us the way to the Father. He, that, that is why the early disciples 
did not call themselves uh, Full Gospel Church of Canada or Tabernacle Assembly of Canada. The first name for churches in, as recorded in the Gospel of the Book of Acts is called The Way. That's how the Christians know. We belong to The Way. So people must have asked him, what way are you talking about? Jesus is the way. This is very important, children of God, because God wants us to not just know the way, the only way to the Father. He is the truth and he is the life. Parents, we have an obligation to raise our children in a God-fearing manner. That is why we want them to come to church. That's why we pray for them. That is why we intercede for them. That is why we want them to recite the memory verse. That is why we try and come early to church so that they will go to Sunday school, that their teachers can teach them. When they come home, we make sure that there is family prayer. We make sure that they pray before they eat their food. Why do we do this? Because we want to train our children in the way that they should go. Because when they're old, they will not depart from it. We want to train our children in one way. And the only way to train them is at the feet of Jesus. If we train them in any other way, it does not lead to the Father. Are you paying attention? Any other way you train your children will not lead them to the Father. He is the only way, Jesus. He is the only truth. Jesus is the truth. He is the only life. Outside of Jesus, there is no eternal life. If we train our children to reach any other way except the way of Jesus, you have not given them life. That's a heavy thought. Parents, we have a great responsibility to raise our children in a God-fearing manner to bring them to the feet of Jesus. You know, uh, I want to take a look at a particular individual. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 16, verse 1 to 3. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Can someone read it for me, please? Thank you. When you read that portion, we come, Paul is, is reaching a certain place. He's coming to a place called Derby. This is where Paul receives the vision. This Acts chapter 16 is a critical chapter. Almost, we have heard so many sermons from this book or from this chapter in Acts, Acts chapter 16. It's filled with great stories and you can go home and train your children to read that story. But Let's look at that first portion. Paul came to Derby, then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Now, we know that in, in that time, there were Jewish Greek people. So they, this doesn't mean that this person is not a Jewish person. It could be a Greek person who is, uh, who is of Jewish, but we don't know. It could also be a Greek person who is not of Jewish heritage. It's never clarified in the Bible. But he is certainly not caring about the traditions of the Jews. We see there in verse 3, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. If he was born in a traditional, faithful Jew community, on the eighth day, the boy had to be circumcised. Timothy is a grown man here. He is not circumcised because his father has given up either on the traditions of the Jews or doesn't believe in the religion of the Jews. Whether he is of Jewish origin or not doesn't matter. His identity he's bought into is Greek. And there, but we see that his mother was Jewish and a believer. And so we all know the training that Timothy received. In when we read Second Timothy chapter 
1 verse 5, if you turn our Bibles there, so 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, we know that this Timothy is a very important person that Paul writes two letters to him. It says that in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. When you look at Timothy's life, Timothy is a person who, even before Paul shows up on the scene, he's a reputable believer. He's already a disciple of Jesus. Paul does not convert Timothy. Timothy already has good reputation and has good character among the other people in that area. In fact, Timothy becomes so important that, in fact, you can say he is the person who wrote the second most amount of letters in the Bible. We all know that Paul wrote many letters, but really we don't know that Timothy co-authored more than six or seven letters with Paul. The many letters that we have in Colossians and Thessalonians and uh, you know all of these letters, Timothy is a co-author along with Paul. He is also there with Paul as Paul is drafting these letters. We can see that when he's greeting. Of course, Paul is the one who is dictating. Someone else is writing. And Timothy is part of that process. So he's not, you cannot say that he's technically a side author. When we, when we read a book, we usually just lift the name of the first person who's written the book. We don't talk about uh, all the others. But Timothy is a surname or is a name that is added to the other letters. He is a person who had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. When I talk to many children who have grown up to become faithful in their walk, and they are prayer warriors, they are missionaries, they uh, have given their life to Jesus, I ask them the question, where did you first learn about Jesus. They almost never the answer came from the pastor from the pulpit. The answer was never was my first teacher in Sunday school. The answer almost always came from my parents at home. Parents have a critical role in training up a child in the way that he should go. But I would say even more so for the mother. Because mothers have an aspect to train your children more than fathers do. And mothers will say, what do you mean? The father is also important. Yes, they are important. But father is necessarily more of a disciplinarian figure. That is why when the child does something naughty or bad, you say, Papa in the verita. Let Papa come home. Why? Because you know that when the father comes, he will be the one who will give out discipline. Usually, it's the mother who all the children gravitate to. They want something from something from something from their parents. They go to their mom. Mommy, any uh, piano I want that drum. They want that game. They don't go to their dad and ask first. They will go to the mother and uh, say, Mommy, I want this. Go and uh, ask your father. You, t you tell for us. Then you will soften it when I ask my father. It, this is what I have seen growing up. Almost always I never go to my father asking him directly, Papa, I want this. I know the answer will be, Yandana. <laughs> Why do you need this? But if it goes through the mother and it's like, Achaya, Achaya, why don't you go to come? We can buy him a small thing, a small gift. It's okay. And there I'm ah, okay. Then I'll go buy him. That's how usually most dynamics are. You, mothers have such an important role in raising up your children. Oftentimes, you're, the mothers are the ones who have such a critical role in bringing up even an infant into a growing age. These, you give them the sustenance, you hold them the most. You comfort them when they're crying. The role that a mother has 
with regards to raising a child is impeccable. In fact, the Bible even tells us that. If you go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, you talk about that. Uh, can someone read that for me, please? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. Amen. So here my version says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Mothers, you have a role to teach them. Our children, the first place they learn is usually from the mother. If you look at my life and you ask me, how do I learn or how do I grow or how I am, you know, a Christian uh, all of this is sourced mainly from my mother and from my maternal mother, where grandmother. Through them, I have learned so much important spiritual truths. When I was about six or seven months old, my mom sent me to stay with her mother in India. So for about seven months to about one year and three or four months, I was with my maternal grandmother. And she would also instruct me at such a young age. If you ask me, I have no memories of that time. I was going through some old picture albums and looking at the pictures that I had and comparing that to Jedi and Jedediah and seeing him like look a little bit similar to me. And it's amazing how like uh, during this critical time, I have no memory of what happened. I don't have memory of being in India. I don't have memory, uh, you know, like walking around naked with shoes in my hands. I don't have any. But there's photos to prove it. Okay, but I, I'm not going to show you any of the photos. But there are photos to prove that I was doing all of these things. I don't know what it is with parents during that time. They really like taking pictures of children with no clothes. Okay, so a lot of my significant uh, photos come from that time is me being naked. Anyway, uh, I digress. Here... The reason why I'm saying that is I have no memory from that time. I don't remember the first three, four years of my life. But during that time, the instruction I received was critical for where I am today. That is why it is important, children, for you to have respect towards your parents. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother. That's the only biblical commandment with a promise so you may live long and prosper. The reason why is because the tears that your parents have shed for you, you have no idea because you don't have the memory. You, you don't know how many sleepless nights you've cost them. I know now very well. I've seen... Betty's tears when Jedimon cries. Sometimes we don't even know why he's crying. And it's like, and she's also crying. Then I look, why are you both crying? I'm also crying. <laughs> it's a, because I feel so helpless. And it's a state that almost all parents go through. It's a period of much refinement on, on the process of the parents. We want to raise our children in the best way possible. No parent comes and thinks that, Oh, my child is not that important. I'll focus on something else. No, everything that a parent does almost always is, how can I bless my child? How can I secure my child's future? What is the most important thing I can do? Almost everything is like, I want to give my child the best opportunity that I did not receive growing up. Almost every father and mother thinks that. It is our desire to push our children to succeed. Give them the best ability. Even better than the opportunities we had growing up. So here, moms, you have an important role. Even before the child is born, you are already taking care of your child. That, that time, I know that, you know, the husband will, will be very careful with the wife. Don't pick that up. Don't take that cover. No, you sit there, you lie down there, I will do the hard work. That time, maybe the wife will not feel like entering into the kitchen because all the smells become overwhelming, so they don't want to enter into the kitchen. And then Acha was like, okay, I will make fish curry. And then the, that fish curry will be a whole different fish curry than anyone has ever eaten. 
I'm talking from personal experience, okay? So I've, I learned now to make really good fish curry, but it was a process. What I'm saying is like as parents, we go through so much. Moms, you go through so much. Even as your child is being born, you're going through so many body changes. You have back pain. You can't sleep at night. Even before the child is born, you can't be sleepless. You're sleepless. And you're going through so much emotional changes. You're going through depression. You're going through pain. You're going through, uh, like, am I doing enough as a mother? Am I eating healthy enough as my mother? If you go to the doctor and the doctor says the baby is not growing, the mother immediately thinks I did something wrong. Mothers, do you play such a critical role? Almost everything that children do, you take it back and it's like, it's a reflection on me as a mother. Here, Timothy is raised well because of his mother and his grandmother. And the Bible also teaches us that m mothers have a very important, so we have this in the Old Testament. If you read it in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Can someone read that for me? Chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. So here we are seeing what Paul is talking about describing or enlisting widows to help them for social, uh, so as a church, they would take care of the widows in their community. Here though, in verse 10, how is a widow characterized as a good widow? She is well known for a good deed, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. The role of a mother in raising up a child, again, once again, even, even Paul talks about it, is very important. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Thank you. When we read this verse, Paul is telling Timothy, no, who trained you in the scriptures? Who is the one who gave you important lectures on scriptures? Verse 15 says, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture. Which infant is getting theological training? How does Timothy from his infancy able to understand scripture? Because... His mother poured it into Timothy. I remember one week after Jeremiah was born, I was holding him in my hands, uh, and I, I started telling him, Jesus is the Lord, your Savior. When you become grown, you have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Get baptized by immersion, and then grow up and be filled with the Holy Spirit and that's the walk. Jesus is the only way, the salvation. He is the one who justifies you, sanctifies you and glorifies you. I taught about that theology. He doesn't know anything. One week, Betty is like, a he doesn't know, understand anything you're saying. But for me, it is so important that my child hears this. I want my child to be raised in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. When a Muslim baby is born, what is the first thing they hear? What is the first thing that a Muslim baby hears? The Shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They are saying the main commandment of Islam. If you have to be a faithful Muslim, you have to say the Shahada and believe in it. You have become a Muslim. The first thing that a baby hears when it is being held is the father or the mother telling the child, this is what you need to know. There is no God but Allah and Prof Muhammad is his prophet. Children of God, that child doesn't understand anything at that age. But even then, Muslim parents know, train them up in, uh, in that way. You go to these Muslim madrasas, they train their children in every way. 
in Islamic studies. They give them also worldly education. They train them apologetics. Some of these children are able to recite verses to convince their friends who are Christians that the Bible is corrupted. Some of our children are not trained to answer some of these questions that these Muslim children are trained from a very young age. Why? Because that is the training that they give it to them. I'm not saying, I'm, I look at that and I admire that. Our children growing up, even many Christians who are in the world today, when Muslims come and ask them about the question, where is it in the Bible where Jesus in the gospel said that he is God? That's the first time that some of our children are actually thinking, oh, is there something like that? And then they go into the gospels and they look for it and they don't find an explicit verse and then they're like, wow, you know the Bible better than all the Sunday school teachers who taught me so far. You must know the truth. Many people are being converted from Christianity to Islam. I was in Markham in 2014 or 2015. I was taking a bus in the GO bus station and I was just standing there. A lady was there beside me. She's a young girl. I think she had like the, uh, the hijab on her and you know, she just struck up a conversation with me. I was like, okay. So she said, oh, what is it that you do? And things like that. And I was like, yeah, I'm here. I'm studying this. I'm doing that. Okay, okay, okay. And then finally she's like, have you heard of Islam? I was like, yeah, yeah, I grew up in an Islamic country. Oh, wow, that is great. You know, like uh, Jesus is a prophet in our, in our book. And she continued to try and convince me that Islam is the true religion. She's maybe 21 or 22 years old. But I knew Muslim apologetics very well. I, I, even at the age of 16, I knew the concepts of Tawheed, about unity, uh, how to explain Trinity to, the, uh, to a person who's a Muslim so that they can understand it. Those things are things that our children need to learn. Because if they have to explain it and they don't have the answer, they will think that they didn't get that instruction, that we don't have the answers for them. We need to train our children. That is precisely why next week I'm actually going to start taking a class on the Trinity here on Sunday mornings. I'm going to explain with PowerPoint slides what the Trinity is and what it is not. That's if God gives us the time and the strength and the wisdom to do that. But my intention is we need to teach our children who is God. He is three in one. He is one. We believe in one God. But our children don't understand these concepts and so they are being led astray. The, reas the reason why I'm saying is see the importance of instruction that you can give to your children. This girl is not a trained apologetic. All she is is a Muslim who is going to the University of Toronto and taking uh, Islamic classes and Islamic history. But because I knew Islamic history, I could speak against and tell her, how do you think the Quran came to be? Who's the person who compiled the Quran? Is there only, she's like, there are many versions of the Bible. There are many versions of the Quran. And she's like, no, 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 there's only one version. No, that's not true. If you study history, that's not true. I can give those answers because I was trained to give those answers. Our children are not. This is why the mission classes that we are doing on uh, Saturdays are very important. Train our children. You should make sure our children come so that they can do good justice to their faith, Christianity. We as parents, but the first place is not apologetics. We don't train our children apologetics. We train our children in the way that they should go. In the Bible, teach them stories. I saw my mom cry every morning that she was at home. 7 a.m., 8 a.m., it doesn't matter where, which room you are, which corner of the house you are, you will hear mom cry, yelling at the top of her voice. Crying, pouring out her heart before God. Sometimes it's annoyed me because this is a Saturday, I want to sleep in. She's yelling. But she's crying and praying for us. She's crying and praying for her church. I've seen that firsthand. When I was a child, my mom would make me sit with her 
while she was praying and crying and has let her tears fall on my body. Some of you parents, the important thing, the most important thing is you crying and praying for your child. Before they go to sleep, just lay your hands on your child, cry and pray for them. This world is a wicked place. You cannot protect them 24-7. Whatever you do, you cannot keep them safe, but there is a God who can. A God who is with them 24-7, who can watch over them, will shield them, shield their minds. Spend that time praying for your child. The love that you show towards God, maybe there's a time that they will walk away from their faith, but they will come back because they saw my mom prayed. That is where most people see their first lesson of prayer. My first Sunday school teaching was not at a Sunday school. Was at my morning family prayers when my dad was gone to work and mom was at home. She would take the Bible stories and tell me stories from Gideon, from the Old Testament, from the stories of Jesus. She will explain the stories. She would be the first person to give me sermons. My first sermons I heard was from my mom. She read the story, she told me these lessons, and she told me what is, why is Jesus important. To this day, I carry that knowledge. Parents, you have a very important role in bringing up your child. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, is the one who pa put a passion for missions inside of me. The reason I went into apologetics was because of my maternal grandmother. She gave me books, Richard Wormrand's book I read when I was 15 years old. Burned for Christ. I read many spiritual books during that time because in, that, in, in Amici's Alamari, there is only those books and in India you had nothing else to do. I didn't have internet back then. I didn't have gaming things. I couldn't go out in the sun because I would die of heat stroke. So I'd stay, sit on with the fan be like, I want to spend some time and open the books. And Amachi will tell me, read that book, Moni. And I fell in love with missions and Christian biographies at that age because of her insistence. Train your children. Train them up. The instruction you give your children, no one else can give. And if you don't instruct them, the world will instruct them. If you don't train them, the world will train them. After a certain age, they will get out of your hand. After that, it's too late to try and bring them. It's not saying that it's impossible. After that, they're gone. If you want to keep them, train them now at an age when they will still listen to you. When they go into colleges, when they go into universities, when they're hanging out with their worldly friends, they're not going to be listening to your voice. They will come back to you. They will come back to you. At the age 24, 25, and a little bit older, the children will come back and say, yes, my parents actually have knowledge. Once they cross the age of 13, they think our parents have no information. Even They don't even know how to like this picture on Instagram. What information they know? They have to see everything I have to train them. That's when children think, oh, yeah, like I'm much more smart than my mom or my dad. But before that, they, you are their world. Until the age of 12, mama and dada is my world. Pour into them during that time. Then when they get married, they will come back and say, I have a son. How did you ever raise me? How did you put up with me? Did I also cry like this? Did I puke also like this? Did I poop so often as a baby? How did you deal with me? And that's where the children will finally come back to it. But don't wait for that. Train them, mothers. Mothers, train your children. You have a very critical role, just like Timothy does. Timothy, in his infancy, knew the importance of Scripture. Even though his father was not a faithful believer, the mother poured into her son. The grandmother poured into her grandson. That's why Timothy is, has these, is seen as the spiritual son of Paul. 
I actually wanted to say something else, so I'm going to end this here with another portion. Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 to 50. I actually closed my Bible, but I actually have to say this is important. Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 to 50. It's a different passage, but I'll, we'll, we'll end there. Paul had no little sons of his own, but he was Timothy's spiritual father. How? Because he took Timothy under his wing. You know, I have many spiritual fathers and mothers in my life. People I look up to who at different critical moments in my life poured into me, walked with me, was concerned for me, fed me like my own earthly mother would do. They were a home away from my home. During those moments, all of them were godly and trained me. When I had questions, when I went through moments of crisis, when I was facing issues in my university and in my college, they were resourceful for me. To this day, some of them still message me once in a while to check on me and see how I'm doing. They have that motherly concern, that fatherly concern for me. They're not my parents, but they're concerned for me. We should take care of not just our people or our children or just my blood children. We need to take each and every single child that is here as our child. My son, my daughter. That's literally what you take on when we dedicate a child here. When you dedicate a child we give, the pastor gives the child to the father and mother, say, raise this child in a godly way and then ask the church to stretch forth their hands and pray and say that you will create a place where you will raise the child in a godly way. We as a church become the parent of the child that is dedicated. Our children, are, these children here, they are, I did not give birth to them, but they are my children. Do you, see, do you see, we as a church need to have that mentality that this is our church, this is our children. We should raise and train them. We take care of our children. We love our children. In the same way here, Jesus is looking at his earthly mother and earthly brothers and saying, that's not my real mother and my earthly brothers. Please, children, don't use this verse to say, now go home and say, you're not my real mother. The, the thing that Jesus is saying is back then there was an emphasis on just the who you were in society, who you're related to in society. And Jesus is saying, the one who does the will of my father, that's my mother, that's my brother. There are many people who are here in the faith without godly parents. There are many people who come and walk into church without their parents here. They could be students. They are going through a different crisis. We should be their parents too here. Invite them. Bring them over to your house. Feed them. You have the opportunity to pour into them like a spiritual mother and spiritual father. Children of God, I just want to end my word here and I just want to say, Timothy's spiritual life came from the training he got from his infancy, from his mother and his grandmother. And we read later on that it is not just about having the blood ties to be a mother or a father. It's about walking before God and doing his will. That's what our children will see and learn first. You can teach them the Bible. You can teach them commandments. You can tell them family prayer is important. But if you don't do family prayer at home, that's what they're going to learn. You will tell them, Lying is wrong. You should never lie. And they will say, yes, Dada, Mama, thank you for telling me. They won't say it like that, but they'll understand that that's a commandment they should keep. For when they find that their father and mother is lying to someone else, and they hear that, then they understand that 
it is okay to lie as long as you don't get caught. The children learn at home first. We as parents need to make sure that we walk before God and do his will. You cannot expect our children to walk in the way of God when we ourselves don't follow. So let us be examples to our children. Let us pray for them. Your tears will never go in vain. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from. Let's close our eyes and pray. Our Heavenly Father in Heaven, we thank you, Father, for this time that you've given to us. Lord, as many people here, Lord, some of us don't have our moms and dads here with us. Some of us don't have that privilege. Some of us, Lord, we, are, we want to be moms and dads, but we don't know how. That is how we can be. Some of us, Lord, we are blessed with children, but Lord, uh, we, we don't feel equipped to raise them in a godly way. Father, Lord, these children are a responsibility you have given to us. Each and every single child in our church is our collective responsibility. We want to train them in the way that they should go. We want to raise them up in a God-fearing way. We want them to grow up in the instruction of the Lord so that they will follow the law of God in their hearts, that they will hide the law of God in their hearts, that they will ne never depart from it. Lord, as much as we want to protect our children and shield them from this wicked world, we can homeschool them, we can train them, we can tell them not to have uh, worldly friends, but the world will catch up to them at some point or the other. We cannot shield them 24-7, but Lord, you can. Give us the wisdom to train them, to teach them the foundation of scripture so that when they grow, grow old, they will be able to hold themselves without being shaken in their faith. Lord, also equip us to be examples of you who walk after you. Help us not to lead our children, not just in word, but also in our actions and deeds. We will represent what it means to be a faithful Christian to be a disciple, Lord. Equip us to live out your will in our lives. Thank you, Father, for each and every single mother in our church. We thank you, Lord, for the spiritual mothers in this room. Thank you, Father, for the roles that they have played in our life, the roles that they are continuing to play in many of our children's lives. Lord, we submit and we surrender them into your hands, Lord. I ask you, Lord, that you will continue to pour into them you will help them to grow in the fear of the Lord because that is the beginning of wisdom. We thank you, Father, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I have the...